Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Gottschall, and thank you, Professor Sternschitz. It's a pleasure to be uh, back, maybe back in quotation marks, at my alma mater, uh, University of Toronto, um, giving this, presenting this lecture to you uh, today. Um, and so uh, I want to set the stage for the material that I'm going to be discussing with you today. Um, I'm, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm a philosopher, um, a um, scholar of Jewish theology um, and Jewish thought, uh, rabbinics, etc. But uh, what I'm going to discuss with you today um, is a very valuable, very valuable material from a historical point of view, but uh, I will be discussing it from its content point of view, from its substantive point of view. So you see the, the title for the lecture already. Um, in order to appreciate what I'm going to say, I, I need to give you a little bit of historical context. Um, and so if I will go to the next um, PowerPoint, uh, look at me, look at my age. This is the only PowerPoint I've ever done for any lecture I've given. So you're very privileged to, uh, to, to see this. This is the first from James Diamond, uh, but I think it's very appropriate for, for this lecture. Um, and so the story of this material that I'm going to talk about begins with a man named Emanuel Ringelblum, uh, a name that should be more familiar, uh, unfortunately is not, is gaining more familiarity. I'll talk about this a little bit later on. Uh, but a Jewish uh, Polish uh, historian um, who, who was born in 1900, um, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really encapsulate in just one minute um, what deserves and, and has deserved uh, uh, entire tomes, uh, particularly from a man named Samuel Kassau, who spoke here uh, a few years ago. But he was a Jewish-Polish historian, a secular man, uh, a member of a um, left-wing Zionist group, the po left Pole uh, Zion group, who in the Warsaw Ghetto decided that uh, the mandate from his point of view uh, was to record for history everything that was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto. That was for him, if I could use language that he probably would use, but not in the sense that maybe religious people would use it, was the sacred mandate to record for history, for posterity, what went on during the years uh, that the Warsaw Ghetto was set up until the, uh, the end of the war. And his name was Emanuel Ringelblum, uh, was already noted for uh, articles for research that he had done uh, in Polish-Jewish relations. And he formed this group called the Oinig Shabbos Group. The Oinig Shabbos Group, um, that was a group of around, it's, 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 it's hard to determine exactly the numbers, but around 50 to 60 poets, diarists, writers, artists, um, historians, who would, their, their mandate was to record in whatever medium they were most expert at, what was, what they were experiencing in the Warsaw Ghetto. And it was called Oinig Shabbos. I say Shabbos because that's the name of the group. I don't say Shabbat because we're talking about Eastern European Jewry. We're talking about um, documents that were written primarily in uh, Yiddish, but also Polish uh, and Hebrew. Um, and it was called that because they met, um, prim uh, but they met usually on Shabbat afternoons, um, and it was called the Oneg Shabbos group. Um, and so he formed this group. Now, at the end of the war, there were only, as far as I know, and as from what I've read, three survivors of this group. A husband and wife, uh, Herschel and Bluma Wasser, and uh, a woman, Ruchel Euerbach. Now, we are fortunate, it's hard to use these terms, fortunate, unfortunate, but let's put it this way, in terms of benefit for posterity. We were fortunate that one of the survivors of that group was, in a sense, one of Emanuel Ringelblum's right-hand men. 
And so Hirsch Wasser was one of the executive board, one of the members of the executive board of this group, the Oynik Shabbos group. And what happened with all these documents was that they were buried. Um, I mean, there were, no, there were no illusions among this group. By the way, neither among this group nor among what is much more famous. Maybe I'll have a few minutes to talk about that why the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is much more famous than this. This is becoming a little bit more known because of Samuel Kassel's work, because of a recent documentary. Uh, but of course, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the armed uprising, is known much more. Um, but um, what uh, happened as a result of this was that uh, a, a number of members of the group were consigned to uh, they all knew that they were done. That is, there was no hope or illusion of escaping, neither with them nor with the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This, that uprising was not about defeating the Nazis um, and gaining victory. It was about going down fighting. And so they knew that this realistically would be the case with them. So they buried, they, they, they actually had some members of the group, some very young members, I would call them adolescents, uh, bury um, this treasure trove of documents. We're talking about 35,000 folios of documents, some 6,000 that translate into 35,000 um, that were buried um, in three different, in, in, in uh, really two different locations. Um, and so here you have the containers that they were buried in, some tin cans, some tin containers, and some milk cans. That what you see before you um, is, of course, the condition that they were discovered in. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, uh, rusted, uh, the material was water damaged, mold, um, etc. After the war, because... Hirsch Wasser was on the executive committee and was privy to where these documents were buried. Uh, that is, he knew exactly the address, 68 Novolipsky Street in Warsaw. Remember, at the end of the war, Warsaw and the Warsaw Ghetto was completely devastated. That is, you could not tell one street from the other. Um, aerial bombing, um, etc., completely demolished everything. And so it was, I, I very, I hesitate to use the word miracle. Uh, I think the miracle, uh, to use the word miracle uh, in relation to these events. I'll use it in a loose way. It was a miracle, not in its theological sense. It was a miracle that the one, one of the three survivors knew where these were buried. And so, um, he directed uh, groups to where he thought they were buried. He knew approximately where it was. And uh, they excavated that area. And so in September of 1946, which was quite soon after the end of the war, they ex excavated the first batch. And so they, there you see a picture of them actually retrieving that material and bringing uh, it up to the surface. Um, the batch, those materials were retrieved in two batches, one batch in 1946 in September, and the other batch in 1950, fortuitously in, uh, found by Polish construction workers who chanced upon it. And so there was another retrieval of another couple of milk cans and in 1950. There still is a third batch that we've never retrieved. Who knows wh whether we'll ever retrieve them. Uh, it, is, um, it is suggested that they are under, uh, I, last I checked, was underneath the Chinese consulate in, or embassy in Warsaw. Uh, good luck with that. Um, so, but in that second batch, there was this one manuscript among the 35,000 folio documents that was retrieved, that is the subject of my lecture today. And that is a manuscript that was written by uh, 
a man, a Hasidic Rebbe, a, a leader of a, of a small Hasidic group at the time, uh, and his name was, uh, you see before you, Rabbi Kolonimus Kalman Shapira, known, as is often the case with Hasidic Rebbes in Eastern Europe. Uh, they're named after the particular town or city or area that they formed their communities. The Piasetsner Rebbe, Piasetsner is a small, was a small town. It's now really a suburb um, of Warsaw, very close to Warsaw. Uh, there you see the dates, 1889, 1943. You can already guess what happened to him during the war. Uh, that's before 1945. And so um, uh, among those documents was a manuscript of sermons that uh, Drashot, that he gave from the moment that the Nazis invaded Warsaw in the, in the September of 1939, on through uh, the beginning of the setup of the Warsaw Ghetto, up until the summer of 1942, when the great deportations begin and the sermons go silent. So we actually have a, a real treasure here of sermons that were given contemporaneously with events that were happening by a man that was living them, that was in real time delivering them to his community as the conditions in the Warsaw Ghetto deteriorated and deteriorated to the point when there was literally no one left. And so the reason this is, uh, it's hard for me to overestimate, to overvalue the significance of these sermons. Because, uh, again, I told you I'm not a historian, so, of course, they have great significance. We can actually date every single one of these sermons. For instance, I don't know, 1940, October, because we know the portion of the week that it relates to, and we know the year it relates to. So not only is it a valuable historical document, but it's much, much more valuable than that from my scholarly expertise point of view. Because it is, and I, I don't exaggerate here, it is the only document of its kind. You might think that there are many out there. There are no other documents. And I don't mean here just qualitatively. I mean that there are no other documents that record an extended theological st struggle contemporaneous with the events, that, he, that the source is a man who is living these events from day to day, from year to year. And some of you might have questions already on that. Perhaps you can address them after my lecture, and I'd be happy to answer them. But that is what my conclusion is, and I think uh, others agree with me as well. Now, ha he was not a card-carrying member of this group, uh, the Oynik Shabbos group. The question is, how did they get there? Which is an interesting um, um, uh, uh, kind of background that still remains unresolved. In Samuel Kassau's book, actually, he suggests that there was, in fact, a relative of Rabbi Shapira's that was a card-carrying member of the group, perhaps one of the only orthodox members of the group, Rabbi Shimon Huberbrand. And there you have a picture of him. Um, he actually uh, was um, commissioned to write about religious responses to the devastating circumstances of the environment that religious Jews, Orthodox Jews found themselves in. And he actually managed to author a manuscript that we now have called Kiddush Hashem, Sanctifying God, which is a record of the way he, he described as a historian, both as a historian and a man who was steeped in the rabbinic tradition, um, how Orthodox Jews responded 
to the events around them in terms of faith, in terms of either preserving the faith, maybe even abandoning it. Um, and that was uh, the reason for the title, Sanctifying the Name of the Lord, which is traditionally a phrase associated with maybe ultimately martyrdom. It, it is associated, obviously, with other things that sanctify God. But the ultimate sanctification of God is in the way a Jew maybe martyrs himself. He was a member of the Onik Shabbos group. And so it's surmised that since he was a close relative of the Rebbe, I will call him the Rebbe, he was a leader of a Hasidic group, Rabbi Shapira, that it got to the Oynik Shabbos archives that way. However, I want to uh, continue the discussion, um, and I'll get to that um, in a moment. When they actually found the archives, this particular manuscript had a note appended to it. Um, Rabbi Shapira hoped for a salvation, but he was under no illusions. He was also a, a realist that, um, you know, the odds were that he would not be around after the war. So there you have the original note. You can see the actual note in his own handwriting. And uh, it was addressed to whoever would find it. What I wanted to just highlight it, he appended these sermons that were given for about two years, two and a half years, with other writings that he had uh, started before the war. Um, and he implores anyone who finds it to send it to his brother, Rabbi Yeshaya Shapira, who lived at that time, I'm, I'll talk to him very briefly, in Tel Aviv, Palestine. Of course, this was before the official establishment of the State of Israel. Please send this, whoever finds this, please send this to him, my brother. When the Blessed One shows mercy and I and the remaining Jews survived the war, he had maybe a little bit of hope that that would happen. Please return all the materials to me or likely to the Warsaw Rabbinate, meaning whoever remains, and may God have mercy upon us and the remnant of Israel. With deep gratitude, Colonimus, his first name. Now, along with that package, those manuscripts, was the following letter to his brother. So this was a direct letter to his brother, once he anticipated that it might get to his brother. I ask you, my beloved dear ones, that once God helps and the essays, now, uh, why, this is very important, that he titled, Chidushe Torah, the novella, the, the, the new sermons on the Torah from the years of rage, Shnot Hazaam, which in, in Hebrew, Tafshin, Tafshin Aleph, Tafshin Beit, 5700, 5701, 5702, roughly 1939 to the summer of 1942, reach you, make an effort to publish them. And then the words of your loving friend and brother, he had not seen him. He, they didn't really correspond. He had sent him some letters. Her yearns for, for you. In fact, his brother had died. And he, he, of course, did not know that because he died. He was murdered before that, had died uh, in 1945, is broken and shattered with his own torments and the torments of all the Jewish people, which are as deep as the manifold abyss. Colonimus. Now, he appends here also the stricture, almost a command, that each and every Jew study my works. Maybe, I don't know. But that I implore every single Jew, remember, he's, he's really writing for a Jewish audience, but I think there is lots to learn here from a larger audience as well in terms of how to confront innocent suffering. Um, now, this isn't a, a, a PR move. This isn't some advertisement to sell books. This is something that comes from his heart uh, 
at a time when he knew he wouldn't be around to reap whatever benefits there would be from the sale of his books. He sees this as a sacred duty that he leaves for posterity, that every man, woman, and child should be obliged to read in memory of this nine of these years between 1939 and in, in, in his a case 1943. I just wanted on the side, I know it's a little bit wordy, my daughter who tells me that's not what you should do with PowerPoint presentations, dad, I'm a little bit um, older, look at me, so it's wordy, what can I do? But uh, this compulsion to publish, to make sure that other people read the memories, the records of the way others have dealt is common. And so I, I here have on the side just three. Um, one from a member of the Oynik Shabbos group, Gustava Jaretska, Jaretska uh, who was commissioned to write a report by the Oynik Shabbos group. She was killed, murdered, along with her two children in 1943, in the beginning of 1943. The last stage of the resettlement is death. These notes, in terms of her own writings, these notes are driven by an instinct, the desire to leave a mark by despair, close to crying sometimes. The record should be hurled like a stone under the wheel of history in order to stop it. I think it's a similar. This is a secular woman who actually uh, did not really have any links to Judaism per se before the war. But she leaves a record that she also feels compelled to say people must read it as something that might stop the wheel of history. Perhaps this report might stop the history of persecution, the history of oppression. Primo Levi, likewise, in his introduction, one of the greatest writers who experienced Auschwitz himself, writers, memoirists of the Second World War. Um, I condemn these words to you, carve them in your hearts, at home, in the street, going to bed, rising. Repeat them. To your children. This is a play on the Shema. Remember, uh, Primo Levi was a secular atheist Jew, or may your houses fall apart. He actually curses his potential audience um, if they don't read his works. Claude Lentzmann, here I want to get to the title. Uh, the title of his work, as it was published until recently, there you have a picture, by the way, of the Warsaw Ghetto's um, brother, who actually made Aliyah very early in the early 20s, was called the Rebbe HaChalutz, the pioneer Hasidic Rebbe. Um, and so that's why he ended up, which is quite interesting, quite rare for a Hasidic family. Um, and so... Um, what I wanted to ju just tell you now is that until recently, those sermons were published by his Hasidim as a book called Eish Kodesh, the Holy Fire, Fire or the Sacred Fire. That was not the name he gave them. That was not the name he gave them. Um, as with everybody, marketing, in order to make it palatable, you give it a name. The name that he gave them was precisely the slide that I showed you before in the note. Really a non-name, a non-name. The Chidushe Torah, those sermons I gave from the years 1939 to 1942, Mishnot HaZa'am, from the years of Za'am, of rage, of wrath. Um, so, uh, why does he call them Zam? It's kind of a, kind of a non-title. He didn't give it that name, Sacred uh, Fire. I suspect that it picked up. Zam is a word that appears not that frequently, frequently, but frequently in uh, the Bible, in the Old Testament, to designate some catastrophe. But I think here I have two um, sources one from Ezekiel, from, one from appropriately Lamentations, that I think captures the nature of and the purpose of these sermons. 
One from Jeremiah. Uh, you could read it in Hebrew for those of you who know. Um, and translate, I sought a man among them to repair the wall or to stand in the breach, a phrase that has become maybe a common phrase for those who are willing to stand up in defense of their community, to standing in the breach. But I found none. God says to Ezekiel, I, don't, I haven't found anybody who stands in the breach. I have therefore poured out my indignation. I will consume them with the fire of my rage. So here we have the first I think meaning of za'am that the Rebbe, this Rabbi Shapiro gave to his sermons, that is he is a man that will stand in the breach in defense of his people. This doesn't mean armed uprising. He would not have a weapon. And if he did, he would not have known how to use it. His weapon are theological weapons. The tools that flowed through his veins, meaning the entire rabbinic tradition. I will use the entire rabbinic tradition to stand in the breach to protect my people from you. You with a capital Y, you God, from your rage. I think that's one sense of za'am, and that's the sense I think clearly that these sermons should be uh, uh, understood in. That is, each of these sermons are meant both to comfort his community, but also meant to protect his community from the wrath of God. Quite a, quite a interesting and radical maybe way of understanding it, but maybe in the tradition also of Hasidut, of maybe even the rabbinic tradition. The second sense is the second source from Lamentations, which is of course a book in the Bible that is the classic book associated with the destruction of the temple. And this is the sense. His raging anger, God's raging anger, he spurned priest and king alike. Meaning that Zom also has this other sense of indiscriminate, indiscriminate destruction. It destroys whatever in its path. It doesn't matter whether you're a tzaddik, a righteous person, or it doesn't matter whether you're a rasha, a wicked person, or anything in between. It's indiscriminate. And that's precisely what this Hasidic Rebbe observed from day to day, from year to year in the Warsaw Ghetto until he was murdered. So I believe those are the two senses that he titled his um, collection of sermons, and that's why. Not the way the Hasidim eventually did. Now, as of late, we have a new edition, and for those of you, I know there are graduate students here who might work on the Holocaust and might come across these sermons. You cannot use the previous edition. You must use this edition that was authored by Daniel Reiser, a very, very, um, you know, expert um, um, uh, academic in Hasidut in general, in Eastern European Jewry. He knows Yiddish fluently. I know him very well. And he studied the manuscript, which by, which by the way, there's a lot of hagiographa uh, around this, is actually still housed in the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw. In the same building, by the way, that Emanuel Ringelblum worked in before the war. Um, and so he studied that manuscript for years and published a new one that highlighted many, many errors um, with new, actually, nobody actually studied the manuscript uh, directly. That is, he actually viewed the manuscript directly. Very, very difficult, difficult manuscript. Um, and so, um, if I can for a moment, this is an original page from the manuscript. Uh, I don't know, some of you may be able to make out some words here. I can't, <laughs> a lot of it. I can if I look at it for a long time. The handwriting is very difficult. But as you can see, the, there's crossing outs, there's marginalia, um, there is uh, stuff, crossing outs that actually where you can't see the words, crossing outs, uh, deletions where you can see the words underneath. Uh, this, which is an indication of there is a constant editorial renovation of these sermons. He gave them and he was, he was 
he was editing them, which is quite spectacular when you think of the conditions. He's starving to death. Um, uh, you know, uh, his whole family um, is murdered. Um, and he continues to revise and edit these manuscripts. And now we have this manuscript that takes into consideration the revisions, the deletions, the crossing outs. Um, and so um, I'll talk about that in, in a minute. So uh, again, um, you must use this new edition published by Yad Vashem. Um, here is an actual, I was there in Poland, uh, in Warsaw. I went to the Jewish Historical Institute. I, I, I held, this is the actual manuscript. I held it in my hand. And I have to say, um, this is perhaps, not perhaps, this is the most sacred object um, I'm speaking here not maybe as an academic, as an objective academic, uh, but as um, a traditional Jew uh, raised um, in traditional Judaism uh, with a rabbinic background. Um, but even from a secular point of view, this is the most sacred object I have ever held in my hands. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing a glove. Maybe the, or, or whoever was showing it to me was wearing a glove. Um, they take very good care of it. and. It's and it's been very preserved, preserved um, um, in, a, in, a, in an expert fashion. Um, and so um, I want to bring you to the subject and get into the content uh, a bit. Um, in Hanukkah, on Hanukkah of December 1941, again, we can, um, we can uh, date these sermons. He said the following, It is true that trials such as we are enduring now come only once every few centuries. In any case, how can they help us understand what's happening currently? When one learns a verse, Talmud or Midrash, and hears of the suffering of Jews from earlier times, how did faith remain intact? In nowadays, faith remain, is weakened. The people who say that trials such as these never existed in Jewish history are in error. What of the destruction of the temple and the fall of Betar? So here, in December of 1941, he says, as any really Orthodox rabbi would say, in order to theologically understand how we should address the inordinate suffering that we're experiencing now, we do what we all, we've always done. We draw on the rabbinic tradition and the classic catastrophes that they responded to and that's adequate. We see the way they responded to it, the destruction of the temple, the Chorban Habayit, the fall of Betar, meaning in 135 uh, CE, the final klop, I can use a bit of Yiddish here, the final strike that meant the end of Jewish sovereignty and Jewish life and Jewish culture in the homeland of Israel at that time. Uh, we look at, you know, whenever we suffer, we look at the way our rabbis responded and we draw our comfort. We understand how to preserve our faith by drawing on what they said. However, and this is very important, you saw those crossing outs and the revisions. He added a corrective note at the end of 1942 to this sermon approximately a year later, when conditions in the ghetto had deteriorated uh, beyond imagination. And this is what he said. The monstrous torments, the terrible and freakish deaths, which the malevolent murderers invented against us, the house of Israel, from that point on, Mishil He, meaning the end of the Hebrew year, meaning the middle of the calendar, the English calendar year 1942, According to my knowledge of rabbinic literature and Jewish history in general, there has never been anything like them. Now, I highlighted, as you can see, according to my knowledge of rabbinic literature and Jewish history, because I think that's important. He's saying both theologically and historically, there is no precedent to what we are experiencing here. What I said to you before, in a moment of incredible honesty that I think has been unmatched to the present date, 
by other theological figures and philosophers that address this catastrophe. This is, I would say, without exaggeration, the only authentic response, meaning only authentic response from somebody who actually is living the experience. He's saying, to my knowledge of rabbinic literature, meaning theologically, whatever the rabbis have said, which is his tools of trade. Remember, this is a Hasidic master. This is a man who lives and breathes history through the lens of rabbinic texts. And he's saying this has no precedent in those texts, nor in the records of Jewish history, neither in the secular dimension of Jewish history, nor in the theological dimension of history. Now, I want to um, say here for uh, just one, one minute that I cannot address this issue of the Holocaust, specifically this issue um, dealing with Rabbi Shapira's uh, responses, and specifically that I'm giving this at the University of Toronto without mentioning the great Emil Fackenheim, of course, who taught at the philosophy department of the University of Toronto, Toronto uh, I would say was the greatest philosopher who dealt seriously with the Holocaust. Now, look at the analogy, I think, between this and what Emil Fackenheim, who was my teacher, who introduced me to Jewish philosophy, to philosophy in general, when I started uh, my undergrad studies at University of Toronto. In fact, one of your own uh, is, a, is a far greater expert in Emil Fackenheim than me. We were in the class together. Uh, your favorite professor, no, one of your favorite professors, Kenneth Green, um, who has recently published a book on Emil Fackenheim's thought. Look at what he said. Um, he wrote a book later called What is Judaism? Not knowing really previously about this Rabbi Shapiro's thought. More than 40 years later, when all is known, what Rabbi Shapiro said in 1942 is still widely denied. Though the worst was unknown to him, the rabbi did not shrink from the terrible truth, that this was unprecedented. Now, um, some of you might be familiar, what, what Fackenheim is known most for, for is that the Holocaust represented a rupture in Western thought and in Jewish thought. It was a literal kind of caesura that um, needed some kind of new response. So um, the reason I bring Fackenheim is because, and I think the way Emil Fackenheim, that quote means Fackenheim understood after the war that what, what Shapira said during the war, the unprecedented nature, is the theological rabbinic equivalent to his philosophical response that with this was an unprecedented event. So in the little time I have left, um, I, I want to get to some other, to really the guts, uh, since we're dealing with sermons that were most certainly given in Yiddish, classical way of doing this, and then uh, transcribed in Hebrew, uh, the kishkas. The kishkas um, of uh, this. I want to talk about two uh, sermons. One at the beginning of the war, and one at the end of the sermons. And so, almost at the beginning, you have in uh, a sermon that we know was um, delivered November 4th, 1939. And the historical context is important. In the initial bombing of Warsaw, the Rabbi Shapira had lost his only male son um, just weeks before that. He had lost his son, his, um, his daughter-in-law, his son's wife, his mother, and his sister-in-law, who had come, who had actually come to visit to Warsaw, unfortunately, and all died in that period. But he lost his son. Chaye Sarah, which begins the, the sermon that begins the Parsha with the life of Sarah, the death of Sarah, begins with a classic association, rabbinic association, between the death of Sarah and what immediately precedes the death of Sarah in the narrative, which is the Akedah, the binding of Isaac uh, 
the potential death of Isaac at the hands of his own father. And as far as I know, this is the most radical interpretation of the Akedah that I have ever seen, certainly that was written then, and certainly that was written since then. This is what he says. He plays on the Midrashic association between the chronological, um, chronological uh, kind of uh, progression between the Akedah and the death of Sarah. And he says, she died for the good of the Jewish people. She gave up her life in order to show God that Israel cannot bear too much suffering. Meaning, I have to soak this in for a while. Meaning that he understand at that point suffering as maybe redemptive, maybe that played into a lot of classical definitions of suffering. It was purgative. It needed to cleanse people. But too much suffering, he says, is corrosive. And that's what he considered the death of a child. And he knows of what he speaks. He's not a sermonic rabbi, topic talking in general. He had just experienced the death of his child. Since she acted for the sake of the Jewish people, the Torah alludes to the virtue of her action, meaning that I, I, I have no other way of interpreting this than to say she committed suicide in order to teach God, you have to come down from the heaven and see what the effects of what you have kind of decreed are having on your people. They're not redemptive. They're not just punishment. They're corrosive because this is destructive. This can have no positive effect. And so I am taking this in to die. I could have lived longer to teach you, God, to come down and see what the effects of these are on human life and so that you will understand and change course. You may have a plan, but this plan doesn't work on earth. This plan has destroyed, I would say, me and is totally destructive. Now, I want to go now from there. So he, he kind of leaves that, often fluctuates back and forth between a theology that might draw on suffering as redemptive, a theology that might draw on uh, suffering that is punishment, and in this last sermon, he kind of come back, comes back to what he, a seed he had planted in his mind originally, two years uh, before, two and a half years before, in the summer of 1942, July 18th, 1942. This is when the sermons stop. This is when the sermons stop, almost a week before the great deportations that literally deport and, and empty out the ghetto of all the Jews uh, on their way to be murdered in the concentration camps. And so this is the worst possible situation. And he says the following, though a father knows the benefits of surgery might have for an ill child, I have it in Hebrew too, those of you who know Hebrew can follow that, he would not tolerate actually witnessing the surgery. For then the knowledge of its benefits would be overwhelmed by his son's suffering, which he feels, which he feels. And so this is a sermon that was given on Shabbat Chazon. Shabbat Chazon is named after the Haftarah, the additional reading that is read from the prophets. That is the week before, the week of Tisha B'Av, the traditional date uh, of the commemoration of the destruction of the temples, which is, uh, starts with a vision, chazon, vision. And so he concentrates on the idea of vision, of seeing. And he talks about how seeing suffering is incomparable, that is, Knowing about suffering, the way we commemorate things, past history, has no comparison to actually seeing them. And he says, when a father knows that a son needs surgery, and he knows that's for his good, but if the father would be in that operating room with his child together, 
he would, despite knowing that the surgery will have ultimate benefits, will say to the doctors, stop, stop. I cannot tolerate the suffering that my child is going through. And he actually, as you read on, is calling, he's using this drasha to completely, when I say about retreat from traditional um, notions of um, responses, rabbinic responses to suffering, here he completely abandons any kind of idea that God has a plan that will be for the benefit of whoever is suffering ultimately. He's saying, I don't care what that ultimate benefit is. I need this suffering like the father watching his child have surgery. I need it to stop now, now. So he's given up on that traditional rabbinic response to suffering. Now, this is important because that idea, the metaphor of God as a surgeon, was a very common metaphor among rabbis living before the war, and that was continually used by rabbis after the war. In order to understand what this Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Shapira, was really subverting in a way, look at what we have after the war, that continues after the war in theology. This is by one Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, really the last Hasidic um, leader of the Lubavitch, perhaps maybe the largest uh, um, Hasidic sect now. In his talks, this is what he says. When actually was confronted with this very issue of the Holocaust, an individual with no knowledge of medicine enters an operating room and sees masked men with knives, meaning doctors, about to amputate a limb, surgical procedure, he would think it's an act of cannibalism if he has no knowledge of surgery. And he says, look, had he known what surgery was all about and why it was now being performed, he would not have been outraged. So he comes in, he doesn't know about, he says, you know, I got to stop these guys. These are torturers because he has no knowledge of the benefits that this will have. Had he known the benefits? Now, think about this for a moment. Rabbi Shapira is directly militating against this common notion that is even being enunciated decades later after the Holocaust by rabbinic leaders and saying, I don't accept this surgery metaphor. Now look at the analogy. The surgeon is God. The observers are the father. The patient is the child. The father here, by the way, in Rabbi Shapira's mashal or analogy, is not like the observers. He knows very well the effects of the surgery. That is, he knows very well about God's, about the theology of God's ultimate plan, that it might turn out better in the world to come or in uh, theological terms. And he says, I don't want this suffering to continue. I reject this metaphor. I reject this theology. We can no longer proceed in responding to innocent suffering after what I've experienced, after what I anticipate I will be gone, and you people now, us, will be reading the, this document. You are no longer allowed, I think I would, I, I would put these words in his, in his mouth, to use that metaphor any longer. It doesn't work. God needs to stop. Now this works on a number of levels, um, meaning these sermons in some sense are also meant to work, I think, theurgically. He, as a Hasidic rabbi, means these sermons to talk to God and to have an impact on God, to stop whatever theoretical plans he has. It's not working on the ground on the ground. So um, just to give you a little historical context, remember July 18th, July 23rd, another man who kept a diary that we have, the head of the Judenrat, the head of the Jewish council, 
that was in charge of the Jewish community in Warsaw, Adam Chernyakov, is reported to have said the following. When he knew all was lost, and he tried his best to preserve this community, but when he was commanded by the Nazis to deliver a product, the product is Jews, five to 7,000 every day to be deported to their deaths. And he tried to negotiate with the Nazis to, to leave out the orphans, the children, with no avail. They said, no, 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 you know, you can't discriminate. He's reported to have left the last note, his last note, he kept a diary virtually every day. They are demanding that I kill the children of my people with my own hands. There is nothing for me to do but die. And he put his money where his mouth is. I'm sorry I'm using that's a vulgar expression. But in this, ter in this case, it's true. He committed suicide that afternoon. And this is the same time that the Rebbe is writing his last in a sense, theological suicide. In a sense, it's a theological suicide. For that Rebbe, who lives and breathes the rabbinic tradition, this was the ultimate, the ultimate expression of despair, of despair. Um, and so um, there's lots more to discuss. I, I, I think I've given you here a, a, a taste of what's in these sermons what's in these sermons. And so I want to end really with another very, to me, maybe one of the most poignant images. And, and here we have um, his signature. This is his own signature that was appended to the manuscripts that he bundled up with these sermons um, that he handed over to be buried. This is the signature, Rabbi Kolonimus Kalmish ben Harav, Kolonimus Kalmish, the son of Morenu, our teacher, Rav Elimelech. Elimelech is the name of his father. Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh L'Chai Olam. This is the, uh, an abbreviation that means uh, his, his name should be a memory and should live on for the coming world. Mi Grodzinsk meaning uh, his father started off in a Polish town called Grodzinsk, also near to Port Warsaw. Uh, he ended up as a successor to his father with a community in Piasetsno, also a community near Warsaw. And now you see something that is crossed out, something that he initially signed as, and that he crossed out most likely, most likely, after that last sermon, at, while the great deportations are going on, because he is most likely murdered in January, February of 1943, um, as he's deported ultimately to a camp, an internment camp, Tronitsky, uh, where he is murdered in one of the largest single massacres, about almost 45,000 Jews, um, before they even got to the concentration camps. And what does he cross out here? Now, as a result of this new edition and Daniel Reiser's kind of um, detective methods with new technology, we know what's underneath there. Uh, what is underneath is Av the Beit Din Bepiasetsno, the head of the rabbinical council, the rabbinical court in this town, Piasetsno. Why does he cross it out? He crosses it out because there is no longer a community in Piasetsno. He no longer holds this position. Uh, technically he does, but it doesn't mean anything because there is no community any longer to, um, to cater to, to preach to, to comfort. And so I find this quite, um, uh, quite spectacular in capturing the moment that is really conveyed by that last sermon, the moment not just of physical despair, uh, but maybe more importantly for this Rebbe, the theological despair where he's shorn of all the tools that he is familiar with, the rabbinic tradition, 
um, as Emil Fackenheim translates into philosophical terms. He acknowledges in that sermon and with his signature the rupture in Orthodox Jewish rabbinic tradition that the Holocaust has introduced. Um, thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to, of course, uh, entertain any questions you might have.